Hello, hello, hello. It is Sunday school time. Let me get my bell here. Sunday school is in session. This is Greater Gospel Temple and Inspiration of God Ministries right here on the World Wide Web. And uh, for the past two weeks, I have not uh, broadcast a Sunday school lesson. There are so many other congregations that are out there to ensure that you are full of the Word of God. Today is Saturday. It's the 2nd of May in the year 2020. Tomorrow is the 3rd of May 2020. And this lesson is for tomorrow's session, Sunday School. So we'll get right into it. The Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations and forever. His truth, remember that. Now before we get into the lesson, I am going to pray. And you can join me in this prayer. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you have not repented of your sins, this you can do today in just a few seconds. If you have repented of your sins and accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and are a backslider, which means that you have turned around and gone back into the world of sin, then this is for you too. God is watching and he's listening for you to repent again and accept him again. Come back. Come back to God. And those who have never been to God, come to God. Okay, so repeat after me. Dear God, I repent of my sins. I ask you in the name of Jesus to forgive me of my sins. And I'm going to add what Elder Davis said from the day I was born up to right now. And God, I thank you and I ask you this. In the name of Jesus, I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And you have done it. You have done it. If you are serious, you are saved. And if you are not serious, you have time right now in between my words to get serious. Because this is no playing matter. God is waiting on you. He loves you. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to be saved. He can use you. You have gifts and talents that have not been tapped. There are things that you have to offer to people that God wants to bring forth through you to help other people to live saved and to see you living saved. You have influence that you know not of on other people. And it's time for you to let God save you if you haven't been saved in the last few seconds. Let him save you by repenting of your sins and saying, God, I, forgive, I ask you to forgive me. I repent of my sins in the name of Jesus and I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Amen. And it's a done deal. You have time. You can do it. I hope you did it. If you didn't, you can still do it. Okay, we're going to get into the Sunday School Lesson, this is Greater Gospel Temple and Inspiration of God Ministries right here on the World Wide Web. Our Sunday School subject is, let me get to it, not condemning nor condoning. Oh, that's a great, 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 great subject. Not condemning nor condoning. And it's found in... The scripture, which is John, the 8th chapter, the 8th through the 11th verses. And I'm going right to that in the King James Version of the Bible Gateway. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him. And he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, 
and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And he again stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. My God, that's what he said to us. Go and sin no more. After he saved our souls, after he made us whole, he forgave us and he saved us. Now, the focal scripture is John the 8th chapter, the 5th through 6th verses, okay? And the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They said this to, him, to test him. And so they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And that's another uh, version of the Bible. So let's go right into our commentary right into the commentary after the festival of booths many went to their homes but jesus went to the mount of olives where he often went to pray and meet with his disciples his father led him to stay in jerusalem and to teach the crowds who came to the temple his father's house jesus rose early to teach those who came early to the temple probably these early Morning worshipers would do some of the most devout worshipers would be, excuse me, I must do that again, okay? You know, I have an OCD about this, okay? Making mistakes, all right? Probably these early morning worshipers would be some of the most devout worshipers of God. Unlike the day before when Jesus had to cry out to be heard by the large crowds, Jesus sat down as was the custom of a rabbi or Jewish teacher to teach those who gathered around him, the smaller crowd, for many had returned home. Now, in this setting, the people would hear or rehear some of Jesus' most important teachings about himself and why he came into the world to save us from our sins and give believers eternal life. So while Jesus was teaching, we can imagine the scribes and Pharisees pushing their way through the crowd, bringing with them a woman caught in adultery, thus bringing great public shame upon her by making her stand before the whole crowd in front of Jesus. Notice, okay, their purpose was not to seek a way to help her receive redemption and forgiveness from God. Now remember that. They meant no good for her, okay? So they addressed Jesus as rabbi out of a feigned or feigned, F-E-I-G-N-E-D, respect, because they wanted to kill him and were seeking to entrap him. The crowd considered Jesus an authoritative, compassionate teacher who healed all their diseases, so the authorities wanted to entrap Jesus as a teacher to discredit him before the crowd. Here's another notice. They did not bring the man who was also in the very act, because the man was probably part of the scheme to dishonor the woman publicly and entrap Jesus. The Pharisees reminded Jesus of what the law of Moses commanded. They already believed he had violated the Sabbath, and they were looking for more reasons to bring him before the Sanhedrin or council for condemnation. If Jesus upheld the law of Moses and judged that she must be stoned, 
he would have condemned her to death and have done what he did not come to do. For Jesus came to seek and save the lost and bring sinners to faith in him that they might receive the gift of eternal life. Now, if he condemned her, he would have contradicted what he had been teaching people to expect from him as the savior of the world and the savior from sin. He would not have been the friend of sinners. So many in the crowd would have lost faith in the sincerity of his loving concern for others. Furthermore, the Pharisees would have succeeded in discrediting Jesus and his teaching before the crowd and his disciples. So they would have destroyed his saving influence. So their test and effort to entrap Jesus and bring more charges against him would have succeeded if Jesus had unwisely answered their question directly. First, if Jesus had upheld the law of Moses and declared that she must be stoned, Jesus would have advocated violating Roman law, for the Romans did not permit the Jews to execute criminals by stoning someone or by any other means. If he had advocated breaking Roman law, the Pharisees would have accused him before Pilate of being a revolutionary, of inciting rebellion against the Roman government, and of telling people to break Roman law. Now, with their testimony, Jesus could have been declared guilty by the Romans and crucified. They would have succeeded in killing Jesus as they hoped, but his hour had not yet come. Second, they thought the law of Moses was clear and could be easily understood and applied. They knew Jesus would be committing a sin if he made void any part of the law of Moses as he seemingly made void the Sabbath law, at least in their opinion and according to their traditions. Then they could have charged Jesus before the Sanhedrin that would have easily convicted him for being a false prophet and pretending to be the Messiah. Thus, they would have destroyed his ministry and influence over the people. They felt they had Jesus in a trap that he could not escape. To begin escaping their trap, Jesus began to write on the ground with his finger. My, my, my. The longer Jesus waited to answer them, the more they kept pushing him or taunting him, for an answer. Because of his delay, they felt they had trapped him, okay? They felt like they had him trapped. Meanwhile, they made the woman keep standing in fear and trembling before the crowd, and the crowd kept listening, listening expectantly for Jesus to pass judgment. Would Jesus break the law of Moses and out of compassion let her go? as he healed the sick on the Sabbath and supposedly broke the law of Moses as the Pharisees charged? Or would Jesus advocate the breaking of Roman law so that the Romans would come and arrest him? Jesus kept writing in the sand. The Bible does not tell us what Jesus wrote in the sand, but we can use our imaginations and come up with various ideas. Now, in the commentator's imagination, he sees Jesus writing down a list of sins or commands in the law of Moses, then demonstrating a wisdom greater than Solomon, Jesus said the one without sin should cast the first stone, and in the commentator's imagination, he had just written a list of sins on the ground that they could see, my, my, my. Now, resuming his silence and writing in the sand, Jesus let the scribes and Pharisees consider what they would do. The crowd that also knew that no one was without sin and only God was good watched expectantly to see who would proudly claim to be sinless 
and come forward to take her away to be stoned. They would not stone her in the temple or on the grounds. They would lead her outside the city walls, as was the custom. While they were leading her out, no doubt someone would have notified the Roman authorities and put the blame on Jesus for condemning her to be stoned. Thus, they had probably planned on him being arrested by Roman soldiers before they stoned her, for they would have wanted to remain innocent. Again, the Bible does not tell us what Jesus wrote in the sand, but we can use our imaginations and think about what he might have written. So in the commentator's imagination, Jesus began to write the names of the scribes and Pharisees by each one of the sins or broken commandments that he had written earlier. And I've heard other people say this, that he probably wrote down their sins. I've heard that said before, okay? So since Jesus knew what was within each of the scribes and Pharisees, he may have begun with the oldest leader and written his name by the sins he had committed. Then he went to the next oldest, perhaps even writing guilty by each name. My, my, my. If Jesus did this, and remember, we have no idea of what he wrote. He said, the commentator tells us that I can see why the scribes and Pharisees would have begun leaving and leaving quickly before he wrote down their names too. He probably would not have needed to reveal the sins of too many of them. Right on, okay? So beginning with the eldest or oldest ones is to be preferred to beginning with the elders. And so we can see that in the King James Version, the New uh, Standard Bible and the New International Version, okay? Amplified Standard, okay? Now, if I had been one of the scribes of Pharisees, this is a commentator, we know that this is the L.G. Parker's Junior Sunday School Commentary. It's uh, com. okay? So if... I had been one of the scribes of Pharisees, says the commentator. I certainly would have wanted to leave before my name was written down and my sins were exposed before the whole crowd as they had exposed the woman's sins before the whole crowd. The Bible does not tell us whether the whole crowd left too, but it does tell us that Jesus was left alone with her. So perhaps each person in the crowd was ashamed of their sins and ashamed of what the scribes and Pharisees had done to being or bring shame to the woman. So they respectfully left Jesus alone with her. So at least we know with certainty that the ones who shamefully brought her to Jesus left her standing alone before him. My God. Then Jesus spoke to the woman for the first time. He asked her if anyone had condemned her. No one had tried to take her outside the city to be stoned. No one had tried to break the Roman law, which forbid the Jews from executing someone. Authorities did not uphold someone. No one had tried to enforce the law of Moses against her, so the religious authorities did not uphold the law of Moses. They had her in their grasp and knew what the law of Moses required, but they did not enforce it. Unlike the scribes and Pharisees, with his authoritative answer to the scribes and Pharisees, Jesus did not break or advocate the breaking of either the law of Moses or Roman law. He did not answer their question, but stayed true to himself. For in John, the third chapter, the 17th verse, Jesus declared, Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus came not to condemn her, but to save her, just like he did us. My goodness, God is awesome, isn't he? If the crowd were watching, 
They heard her tell Jesus that none of the authorities had condemned her. And if they heard Jesus say that he did not condemn her either, they were probably amazed at his wise, compassionate application of Jewish law and Roman law. In addition, neither the woman nor the crowd were left with the impression that Jesus condoned breaking the law of God. He called her behavior a sin and told her not to sin again. We do not learn if she repented of her sins and asked Jesus to forgive her as he had forgiven others. We do not know if she believed in Jesus as her Lord and Savior and received the gift of eternal life, but Jesus gave her the opportunity to do so by not condemning her. Jesus wants to forgive us for our sins, not condemn us. He wants to lead us to faith in him. He wants us to receive him and also receive from him the power to become children of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Not condemning nor condoning. My goodness. So here are your five questions to ponder over and to answer in your time. Number one, who brought the woman to Jesus and why did they? Number two, what was the charge against the woman and what was the punishment if she was found guilty? Number three, why might they have not brought the man to Jesus too? Number four, what might Jesus have written on the ground with his finger? Number five, who condemned the woman and what did Jesus tell her? Those are your five questions to think about not condemning, nor condoning. I pray and trust that God will continually bless you each and every day. I'm praying for you, and I know you're praying for me too. If you haven't prayed for me, please pray for me in the name of Jesus. I love you. This is Greater Gospel Temple and Inspiration of God Ministries right here on the World Wide Web. You can call me at 469 629 nine five four three four six nine six two nine nine five four three i love you i love you i love you